right, welcome to Alabama Gristmill. Good to have everybody join us today. Uh, we, with I'm Mike Causey, my co-host Donna Causey. How you doing? I'm doing good. It's a good day today. Well, you're recovering. You're recovering from a cold. That's why we're yeah. a little late on this one. Right. That my voice didn't sound too good, and it kind of went out once in a while. So I'm sorry about that, but. No, well, it's yeah, better that didn't today. make for a good podcast when your no. voice goes in and out. It's bad enough as it is. <laughs> I have an accent that is heavy. So you're from the South? I did not realize that. Oh, I know it. And I didn't realize how heavy my accent was until I started listening to it on this podcast. <laughs> but bear with me. <laughs> that is definitely a wake up call when you hear yourself on the, <laughs> oh, <laughs> talking and everything. I, 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 like, oh, wow. I hope people aren't laughing at it too much, but it. The only thing I can do. I'm I'm southern and I'm all the way through. I guess southern, true and true. How's your weather been, Rainy? Uh no. It, well, it's been kind of you know th- summer thunder showers around here, but you know it hadn't been too bad. It, they seem to kind of miss us. They're dancing around us. You know how they do sometimes. Yeah, these southern pop up thunderstorms are a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, just uh, all of a sudden you get a, a, a what we call a gully washer. Right. Coming in and out of the blue. It could be sunny. And then next thing you know, bam. There it goes. And it comes down hard. And, and then you and then you can walk a little bit and you might get out of it. Or, you know, and they just kind of go from one cloud. Just kind of. This is true. Out. Well, this, for today, we've got a story that's actually uh, pretty uh, timely considering all the uh, the political discourse we've got going on in the country. I mean, we're not going to get political on here. That's not what we're about. But we wanted to, you know, talk about as far as the. The politics of what we were going through today is not unique. It's not the first time we've gone through this as a, in a country or in a state. Yeah. It used to be kind of like the Wild West around Alabama because it was the frontier area. And that's that's where it really got hot and heavy, too. Yeah, it's a little bit more explosive back then with everybody really getting very opinionated. Oh, yes. I mean, you got to remember that a lot of people, when Alabama started, it had not been that long since we became a country. So feelings came hard you know they fought a war to become in we fought a war to become independent from great britain and those feelings kind of carried on over into alabama and every, all the other states for a while it took a while to tone down well yeah civil discourse you know when you're coming off you know <laughs> a war and tough times right. you know, it's just the revolutionary times obviously yeah. and, hence the name i guess right and it, it makes it very difficult to have just a straight up discussion and diplomacy. The, there was a big controversy between the Whigs and the Democratic Party, you know, in the early 1800s, because it was the Whig Party was still a big party. And, and that's what this story is about, right? Is it, right? About the Whig and, Whig and Democratic parties in the time. Exactly. Well, before we get into that, I want to mention that, uh, you know, yeah, we've got a, uh, to support what we're doing here on Alabama Grist Mill, we've got a, uh, Patreon, which is uh, helps support us, you know, and you join that on a monthly basis, and, and it helps us uh, keep this thing going and keep the podcast going as well as the website. You can find information about that on the uh, the website. And with that, we have a war of uh, goals we have set, you know, in certain goals we set. You know, everybody will get a, you know, some we in the previous we've done ebooks and things like that, and you get early access to to the podcast and. Uh, oh yeah, also a lot of, lot of, benefits, lot of benefits that we like to add to it. You know, and we really, really appreciate your support, and we want to reward you somehow. And this is what we have: is yeah. a lot of different books and eBooks given away, and, and you get, you like get only get access to the articles on the website as well. So, oh yes, you do. You get. Uh, we have on some Patreon only articles. Eventually, they will make it into the being free, but at the patrons get to see everything first. Otherwise, without that, we can we we couldn't support this as long as we have, and uh, because this is a we've got a lot of data out there, a lot of servers, a lot of <laughs> a lot of stuff going on, and a lot of members, which is which yeah. is good. We have you know a lot of people coming to the site at, on a daily basis and newsletters and things like that. So we really appreciate all that. Just wanted to put that out there. And if you also want to just make a donation, you, we've got a PayPal on the site. You can click on that and just send us a donation, just a one-off if you want to do that. So we've got other options there. But, I you know, got that out of the way. Uh, let's go ahead and get, get into the, the story. story. <laughs> yeah, well, that's my favorite part is getting to the story of what uh, this uh, a similar situation of what we've got going on now back in the early days of Alabama. Yeah, this one was kind of interesting. It, it occurred way back in the early days, around the year 1836. 
And it was after the militia in Montgomery was well organized because it happened around in the area of Montgomery. Like I said, the Whigs and the uh, Democratic Party were really competing quite vigorously. The colonels and the captains were elected to the militia by direct vote of the people. So the militia was really a strong area of uh, controversy in politics for the people. And during that summer of 1836, there was a regimental muster held about nine miles south of Montgomery on the road leading to Troy. So you can kind of think about where that area is today. Being a militia leader was a very prominent position because they were very, very important in keeping the order of things because we didn't have a whole lot of law enforcement at that time. Colonel Thomas Maston was the commanding officer of this group, and he was very popular He belong- in the Montgomery area. He belonged to the Democratic Party, and he was leader of the Democratic Party. A gentleman by the name of Bush W. Bell and his two nephews with a party of friends went out to Montgomery to that muster, and they carried a tent with them. They were Whigs, and they were popular as well. But when the muster was over, Colonel Maston went to the tent of the Bells by invitation, and soon afterwards, he and Edward Bell got into a political dispute and fight in which Bell stabbed and killed Maston before the friends could separate him. So it got kind of hot and heavy back then. Maston was very popular, and he had a wife and two children, so it really was a tragedy that he was killed. The killing was not premeditated. There was no malice or unkind feeling existing between them before the difficulty because they were just visiting, but the argument just blew out of hand. It was done in the heat of passion and without time for reflection. Bell went back to town, and he realized what he'd done, so he surrendered to Temp Reed, the sheriff of the county. He gave bond for his appearance and was at the next term of the circuit court to answer for the charge of murder. Before the trial, he and his friends employed the best legal talent in the area because they had the means to do so. Colonel Thomas Williams of Mobile, who had the reputation of being the best criminal lawyer in the state, was employed as the leading counsel. Well, they argued a long time over what to do, and at the trial, Bell was acquitted because I guess he was, it wasn't premeditated. It was just an, an act that just came out of passion. The family and the immediate friends of Baston did all they could legally to secure a conviction, but failing and being good law and abiding men, they let the matter drop. So they didn't pursue it further because they had taken him to justice and uh, had to accept what happened. Unfortunately, the matter didn't stop with them, though. William Mooney, with his family, resided about 20 miles southeast of the city, and he really liked Mastons. He was not in any manner related to the Mastons, but he was a Democrat, and he stood up for his party. He didn't like what happened to Maston. He loved his friends and hated his enemies, so there was no in-between with him. And he was a man of some prominence in his vicinity as well. His son, Kenan, or better known as Ken, who was about the average of young men of his day, was popular with his friends, and he had never been accused of any wrongdoing. He had a good moral character, and he took an active part in politics, just like his father. They were friends with Maston up before this political incident happened, and since their political friend had been killed in a political fight, they determined to avenge his death. And that's where the trouble started. It is not known whether the Bells have been informed of the intention of the Moonies or not, but the Bells and the Moonies met near the old Montgomery Hall, and a desperate and deadly fight took place. Young Bush Bell killed William Mooney, and Ken Mooney killed Edward Bell, Maston Slayer. And Bell had no family. His body was taken in charge by his friends there being no undertakers during the day. Mooney's body was carried home to his family, and Bush Bell escaped and left left Alabama, but Ken Mooney was sent to jail. In a few days, Mooney's friends made Ken's bond, and he was discharged and returned home to his family. In a short time after, another company muster was held at a place called 
Goggins Mill, about one mile east of Robertson's Crossroads. And about noon, Ken Mooney rode up and hitched his horse. He walked quietly up to the crowd, but he was armed to the teeth, and I guess he just couldn't let the situation go. There was an old lady on the ground with a cake cart, and Mooney took a position near her cart without speaking to anyone. He didn't argue. He didn't fuss. He just quietly took a position. After the muster was over, a man by the name of Alistair Owens went up to the cart to buy some cakes. And for some reason, there was no discussion between the two of them, but Ken Mooney, without any cause of provocation, walked up to that man and stabbed him to death. He was just very filled with anger, I guess. When Owens was seen to fall, someone cried out to go for a doctor. But Mooney remarked that if they did bring a doctor, then they'd kill him too. His anger was that severe. In a few minutes, he mounted his horse and rode deliberately away as if nothing had happened. And everybody just stopped and were in awe of it, and they realized that if they tried to arrest him, they'd probably wind up dead too, so no one attempted to uh, capture him. Owens was a quiet and an inoffensive man, and no one knew any reason why Moody should want to kill him. It was just so unexpected. Everyone expected that Mooney would leave the country, but he didn't leave. He went back home, and when it was learned that he had not left, a bench warrant was issued for his arrest, charging him with murder in the first degree. The warrant was placed in the hands of the sheriff, who then placed it in the hands of his most trusted deputy. And the deputy raised a large posse of the best citizens of Montgomery, and the sheriff instructed them to arrest Mooney and bring him back dead or alive. Some of Mooney's friends learned that the sheriff and the posse were getting ready to make the arrest, and so they informed him. Mooney happened to be at his mother's house, so he barricaded the doors and windows and prepared for a siege. When the sheriff's posse arrived, they demanded for him to come out and surrender. But he sent them word he would do no such thing, and the first man to set foot inside that yard would be killed on the spot. And they knew he meant it because of the incident that happened. They knew that they would be in danger themselves. The sheriff's posse that were at that went in. They didn't want to get killed trying to uh, make the arrest. And to attempt to force an entrance would be death to some of them they knew. And, they, and to go back to town and report to the sheriff that he was in his mother's house and they could not arrest him, they just couldn't do that. So they tried to figure out what to do. They got together, and they decided to send back to town for a cannon and ammunition to actually blow the house down and give his mother and Mooney the choice of coming out or remaining in as they saw proper. They selected Philip Rayford and Theodoric Ruddle to go back for the cannon. They procured the cannon and ammunition and mounted it on a wagon and started back. Well, Mooney's friends learned about the cannon coming, so they waylaid the road, and when the house, when the cannon got near the house, they fired the wagon, at the wagon, and badly wounded Rayford, and made the horse run away, and scared poor Ruddle nearly to death. In the confusion and excitement that followed, Mooney managed to escape and make for the swamp. Those men were not to blame. They were not expecting anything of the kind, and there was nothing left to do but to take their wounded and the cannon back to town and report to the sheriff. The next news of Mooney reported that he was in the southwestern portion of the county. There was a volunteer military group in the county with about 60 members called the Prairie Invincibles. The warrant was placed in the hands of the captain of that company, and he was ordered to arrest Mooney, or run him out of the country at least. The captain detailed 16 of his best men, and they assembled at the appointed place of meeting, armed and mounted. About sundown, they set out in pursuit of Mooney. It was a bright, moonlit night, and they searched in the neighborhood of what is now called Raymer, making inquiries. Then they went in the direction of Tucker's precinct, where they learned that in all probability he could be found at the house of Dick Colbert, who was living about four miles from Tucker's in the direction of Pentlala Creek. Colbert was a bachelor living by himself and a man of some property. On their route to Colbert's house, 
Two or three of the men straggled and got behind. As it happens, they probably began to second-guess the decision to go after Mooney after all that had been happening. In all armies, there are stragglers such as that. As they approached Hobart's house, there was a lane, and on the side of the lane was a gin house and an old-fashioned wood screw about 150 yards below where the dwelling was. When they rode up to the screw, there were two African Americans sitting under it. And when asked if there was anybody at the house, they said, Oh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Ken Mooney and Mr. Charlie Spratt, they're at the house. And they hurriedly rushed over to the screw at that time and began turning it, which made a loud noise. That was the signal to the men in the house that the, there was someone out after them. The captain ordered his men to dismount quickly and surround the house on foot. But it was too late. The screw was the signal of danger. Before the men could get in position, Mooney and Spratt ran out of the house, mounted their horses, which had already had been pitched, bridled, and saddled in the yard because they were expecting danger to come their way, and they wanted to make a quick getaway. They rushed past the gate and out of the lane at full speed and made good their escape because everybody was not prepared at the time to do anything about it the captain ordered his men to fire eight or ten shots were fired after him but with little effect neither of them were hurt because they obviously were going so fast and so quickly mooney did not did lose his hat and it was later kept as a trophy because they did have that something that had happened and he realized then and there that he was an outlaw evidently and he would have to surrender or leave the country and that night was the last ever heard of ken mooney his family and friends never heard of him again. He probably changed his name, which was quite common during those days. And uh, where he went was never known. He had some good traits of character before. He loved his family. He loved his friends. And if his hands had not been stained with human blood, he might have been a good and useful citizen. It was never known why he became so violent and came back, other than just the anger over the politics. And that's so sad. Well, it just shows you how how it was tough, rough and tumble back in those days. Oh yeah, I mean, very rough really... and tumble. <laughs> well, they didn't have a whole lot of law, and the, and um, billings ran high. I imagine you know in that, that to say the least. Yeah, they definitely ran high with them for some reason. It, it was kind of interesting why then no nothing was said why he stabbed that man by the keg stand. You know, just out of the blue, it didn't have. He was not related to the situation. And that set it all into motion. It did. It set it into motion. A lot of people during those early days would leave. If they got in trouble like that or had something going on, they'd leave and go to Texas. So he may have wound up there and changed his name. He may have lived a decent life afterwards. You never know. But his anger really was out of control that day. Well, I mean, it's funny. That all just happened. What, just a little bit south of Montgomery? Yeah, just a little bit south yep, of down, Montgomery, around the down round that, Troy, nowadays uh-huh. where they where they make uh, Hyundai's. Oh yeah, <laughs> interesting. You know, they had that interesting time back then, and now they make Hyundai's there. Yeah, now they make Hyundai's there, but that's what took place at that time. So it is really interesting. These little stories that creep up, you never know what happened in such and such places that you see nowadays. And that's what's nice to know. You can drive by and say, oh, that's where Ken Moody. <laughs> it's not exactly where they make the no, Hyundai's. It's, it's just in the that area. area. It's just south of yeah. and Lala and all that. It's spread out all over, you know, but it happened to do around the Montgomery area. I also got a kick out of the fact that, you know, they said, you know, we got to get him, so let's go get the cannon. I know, and you know, I love like, that. <laughs> well, we're not going to deal with the rifles. We're just going to step it up to get a cannon and take mm-hmm. care of business. Right, then, then they got a big military troop after that. They realized it, it was so successful. And, he was um, warranting a lot of uh, ammunition against him, I guess, for sure. There, there was no dealing with him, you know, diplomatically, I don't think. It was just they knew that. They knew they risked their life. But I love, I like that one, too. And it still didn't work. So... It was a definitely an, an adventurous time and a, and a crazy story. So, to the point where he had to leave, that's yeah, right. Leave the country, potentially leave the country, if not just go to Texas. So, and and family and friends didn't never hear of him again. So, or so they say anyway. Yeah, I don't story. think they'd be mentioning if they did. I don't yeah. think they would either because I know that they might kind of get like him a tried witness down. protection program back. But on the other side, he was more on the lamb doing the Whitey Bulger. 
Right. Well, that will go ahead and uh, wrap this episode up of uh, Alabama Chris Villa and the legend of Ken Mooney. And we'll have some more stories, Alabama, coming up. Uh, stay tuned and subscribe and share with friends and family and get, give us a review if possible on iTunes or uh, Apple Music or Apple Podcasts or however you listen to the to this podcast. We'd love to that. We really appreciate any of that. And if you've got any information about ken mooney and this legend yeah Pop somebody may know where what happened to him you know yeah or if that's one of your relatives <laughs> yeah <laughs> that let would us be, know. tell us more about it and what really exactly. would happen to the what really or have you even actually heard of this le- the legend of ken mooney have you heard this before yeah. let us know be interested to see how how far it got out there but uh well th- with that we'll let old red fully play us out with a little alabama jubilee